Plus Ultra, Why Sayed Does Not Have Limits by Martel Baudry Introduction In great antiquity, the Prometheus flanking the Strait of Gibraltar were known as the Pillars of Hercules. Erected by the anonymous hero as part of his tenth labor, they marked the end of the known world. According to Renaissance tradition, the pillars bore the inscription on Nec plus Ultra, no further beyond, serving as a warning to interpoised sailors. No one could tell that if anything lay beyond. Francis Bacon used this allegory as the frontispiece to his ambiguous program for a new science, the Novo Organum, in 1620. It depicts a ship sailing through the mythical pillars, venturing to the unknown. Ever since Bacon campaigned for a new philosophy, scientific knowledge had increased in a break breathtaking pace. In a matter of four centuries, we have unveiled the origins of our species and all other life on the planet, explained the nature of infection diseases, landed on the moon, split the atom, and just recently detected gravitational waves. Not only has science accumulated ever more knowledge, but it has also drastically increased in scope from other regions of the universe to the inner sanctum of the human mind. Many people don't welcome this meddlesome scientific curiosity. Whether you like it or not, science has reached pretty definitive answers on many questions of human interest, leaving traditional myths and doctrine in ruins. In the wake of this impressive body of knowledge and the untenable technological fruit that it bears, an educated person living in the 21st century can no longer reject the authority of science altogether. But is the sky the limit? Many people maintain or hope that there must be some limitation to scientific investigation. Science is a powerful instrument, they admit, but it cannot answer every question. Surely there must be some mysteries that science will never unravel. Some domains where it cannot venture? Science can launch rockets and split atoms, but it cannot tell us why we are here. Or perhaps questions of origins are within its purview after all. But the human psyche remains off limits, or if not the whole of our psyche, which is for there is a uh, physical lesson has proved that computational field of the mind and functionalism proves the origins of human consciousness and how we can artificially create artif uh, art uh, our consciousness using AI, which we are in the bleed as actually created our AI. <clears throat> and in case, it's not much of human knowledge arrived at through non-scientific means. According to these people, for science, the venture beyond its natural limits is to commit a sin of scientism. Science itself is not the problem, they maintain, but rather the overextension of science into all domains of inquiry. Traversing the pillars of Hercules is a form of scientific imperialism, hubris, fundamentalism, or totalitarianism. But what are those limits of science? Are there other equally valid ways of knowing besides science? Or do the limits of science coincide with the limits of human knowledge? Should we imagine science one sort of vessel equipped to navigate certain waters, but perhaps not to others? If science has scientific uh, identifiable limits, are there other ways of knowing that can venture beyond? The variety of scientism. There is no consensus on the meaning of the term scientism. In this chapter, I will focus on its primary epistemological sense related to the limits of scientific knowledge, but there are a number of other usage. It may refer to an excessive difference to science. An unhealthy obsession with grand unified theories or bad habits that denigrate disciplines other than the natural science. For example, C. Piglisui. Other people use the term to criticize overblown confidence in the future of progress of science. For example, the idea that science will soon make us all immortal, see for example futurist Hubert de Grey. The most crucial aspect of scientists, according to Sorel's book on the subject, is to that the scientific is much more valuable than the non-scientific, although the non-scientific is of negligible value. But I will not discuss these forms of overheated or misguided science enthusiasm. It's quite clear that even our best science remains fallible, and there are other valuable things in life besides science, art, literature, sex, entertainment, gardening, perhaps even sports. It should come as no surprise that the term scientism in this epistemological sense has many abusers. People all grips are quick to throw out scientists gambit whether some scientific theory enroaches on their turf or frantic their particular worldview. Mediums and psyche use the word of inquisitive minds. Religious believers hurry around to protest sacred doctrine for the advances of science. Postmodern relativists press into survey to unmask the pretensions and imperious ambitions of science, bringing down to the level of other, equally valid ways of knowing. Even some philosophers and humanities scholars seem overly ancient that said scientists are bent on hostile takeover of their disciplines, and have tended to use the word scientism in defensive and purely justified fashion. 
expression. In short, whatever value there is to notional scientism, the term's real meaning or too of it boils down to science I don't like. For that reason, the very mention of the term in scientific circles often provoke eye rolls and grows of impatience. In an ironic twist, some of Earth's supporters of science have started to embrace the term as a defiant norm that bloom, as a way of preventing their critics. And yet, the question of scientism deserves an honest appraisal. We should not leave it to theologians and postmodernists to pontificate about the limits of science. Yes, the term has plenty of abusers, but any concept with a normative value carries a potential for abuse. Take pseudoscience, an inherently pejorative term that, to the best of my knowledge, has not yet been taken out as a badge of honor by anyone yet. In one of his intelligent design tracks, the Berkeley professor of law, Philip Johnson, point that Darwinism is a pseudoscience that will collapse once it becomes possible for critics to get a fair hearing. Does this hijack of the term pseudoscience mean that we should abandon the concept altogether? Of course not. In this chapter, I will retain the prerogative sense of scientism as opposed to the positive sense as a badge of honor. By definition, then, scientism is that which pushes science beyond its epistemological limit. If there are no such limit, then there is no such thing as scientism. First, I will defend the naturalist, holistic conception of web of human knowledge, and according to which science is interwoven with everyday knowledge, philosophy, and other academic disciplines, drawing inspiration for evolutionary epistemology. Argue that we don't identify as the border between folk knowledge and science is con a contingent of our cognitive makeup, and thus is largely an asset of a history of biology. From this holistic point of view, the notion of limits to science becomes difficult to defend. Still, I will try to find out if there are any clear breaks of our web of knowledge which even an inveterate naturalist should be willing to accept. Working by elimination, I discuss two realms that are often regarded as necessary beyond the purview of science, the supernatural realm and the moral realm. In the case of the supernatural, I defend the inclusive nature of science that attacking the methodological structures imposed on science by those who want to conceal it with religion, in this case of morality. Finally, I will argue that science reached some sort of limit, but this I will see still provide no suitor to advocate of other ways of knowing. Everyday Knowledge and the Manifest Image Let's start with a completely unexpected source, who is not an enemy of science by any stretch. According to philosopher Hilary Pullman, it is of utmost importance to acknowledge that there are other forms of knowledge besides science, a view of knowledge that acknowledge that the sphere of knowledge is wider than the sphere of science, seems to be a cultural necessity. If we arrive at the same and humane view of ourselves of science, but how are we to make sense of such limits? It all depends on our definition of science. It has a rather narrow definition that will be clearly turned out by other sources of knowledge besides science, but if we adopt a more inclusive definition of science, the question of limits of science will receive completely different answers as an entry to scientism. In the Dictionary of the History of Science, Pooh said, The legitimate scope of science is of course an issue. One man's science is another man's scientism. For example, if we restrict the concept of science to natural science, excluding history and humanity, no sane person would dispute there are forms of knowledge besides science. If, however, we define science so broadly as to encompass any conceivable form of, no of human knowledge, and because uh, we will have to define any limit to science out of existence, we have to steer between Scylla and Charibs on the paid of civilization. From naturalistic point of view, human knowledge forms entirely interwoven. What we call science and mention the web where there is no sharp distinction between science and other form of knowledge, and a strand within the web are mutually interdependent. As a case in point, consider the borders between science and everyday knowledge. Pullman knows there is a plenty of everyday practical knowledge that can't be scientized. For instance, when we pick the meaning of the word in a foreign language by hearing how it used in context, such inference according to Pullman are not in any serious non-trivial sense scientific inference. There is of course some value of Pullman distinction. Some facts are plain for everyone to see and do not demand any special expertise or theoretical knowledge. Facts about tables, chairs, animals, plants, river, and rocks. Other demand technical expertise that are more local and apply in nature, plumbing, gardening, violin making. Still, other demand theoretical knowledge, but the kind there are every normal human being is naturally in door with myths, language skill, folk psychology, folk physics. Science, as commonly understood, is concerned with force of knowledge that are not obvious, intuitive, or immediately accessible. The product that can be scientists, busy demand technical apparatus, statistical analysis, careful measuring, cross checking, control observation, and extensive collaboration. But how important is that distinction? Our particular perceptual and cognitive endowment determines what we acknowledge beyond the manifest image. 
what is left to specialize scientific investigation or craftsmanship, for example, human needs science to detect UV light, but bees do not. If we could see Jupiter's moon with our naked eyes, we would not need a scientific genius like Galileo and some fancy equipment to discover them. We should not have called this knowledge scientific. If our eyes had built-in microscopes that allow us to see bacteria detect infection, we probably would not talk about the germ theory of disease. Bacteria would just be part of our manifest image, or our familiar furniture of the world. If creatures from Proxima Centauri system were to visit our planet, much of human behavior might initially appear totally incomprehensible to them. Suppose they observe one human being punching another one in the face after the on the mouth and the first hand had opened, his vocal cords started vibrating. For any human witness, it would be perfectly obvious that the second human being became angry after the first insulted his mother. For a Centauri scientist, whoever not endowed with the intuitive understanding of the human emotional reporting in our international psycho uh, psychology, such people behavior might appear completely baffling. As Daniel Dennett had argued, real patterns of human behavior would not become visible to the Centaurians until they learned to treat human as intentional systems with beliefs, desires, and emotion. Once they have adopted this intentional stance, the Centaurians might then proceed to conduct through all scientific study of human facial expression and body language, a human emotion related to family, honor, game theories about emotional commitment, and psychology of differences and retaliation. Much of what human beings get to for free in the form of full psychological knowledge will be state-of-the-art science for Centaurians, or they by carefully observing regularities in human behavior, testing hypotheses about our disposition and reactions, and so on. Our idiot friends, in turn, might have innate cognitive and perceived talents of their own, eating knowledge that in human beings would require the use of cardiac as science, but they could be directly absorb red shifts in the sun or pick up curvature in spacetime, the way of our vestibular organs pick up in directions of gravity, questions about the limits of society and lose force here. Let's now return to Pumit's example of understanding of foreign language. Does his story show that such knowledge is of limits to science? And most, it shows that we humans do not need science to obtain certain forms of particular knowledge because nat nature already equips us with several language skills by the time we reach at the lenses without much explicit instruction. Language skills come for free. With most other research development already carried out by blind evolution. In most everything contests, our language module, perf uh, module performed admirably well and allowed us to figure out the meanings of foreign words, but that's not entailed that the study of foreign language of limit to science. Indeed, professional linguists that conduct scientific investigation into syntax, semantics, and pragmatics of different languages. Psycholinguistic reconstruct the unconscious inference of heuristics to underlie our innate language skills, and evolutionary psychology try to figure out how these models have evolved and are developing implement. Though it is true that we normally don't use science to learn new language, we do use scientific methods to solve more daunty problems of translation, for instance, to decipher an ancient text in an unknown language. In short, what Puma gestures are not epistemological limit of science, but the condition under which we need it. This harbor is contingent on both the cognitive makeup of our species and standard evidence and exploratory depth. We demand in any given situation, we don't need a scientist to tell me that I had some yogurt for breakfast today, but I do need a nutritionist to tell me its caloric value or tell me what Bel uh, Belgians in general eat for breakfast. If I don't need a scientist to tell me if it's raining right now, though I do need a meteorologist to tell me if it's going to rain tomorrow. I don't mean a I don't need a scientist to protect what will happen if I saw someone's mother, but I do need a scientist to tell me if punching this person in the face really will help me to vent my anger. I won't. It will make me more aggressive. Non-scientist knowledge, by the way, can be described of predictive, specific, or more generally applied of theoretical, just like scientific knowledge. My plumber may be quite a truth in investigating leakage, but we will not ordinarily call him scientist, nor will we call an expert or violin maker a scientist. From an epistemic point of view, however, there are plenty of commonalities between a biologist who is doing the lab and what plumber is doing that he is trying to locate a leak in my water supply. The plumber is making observations, testing out different hypotheses, using logical inference, and so on. The main difference is that he is working on a relatively mundane and isolated problem, my sink, which is both 
simple enough to solve and his own with reasonable confidence and parochial enough to concern no one but me and him. No need to attend a conference or many articles to peer review journals about my kitchen. It would certainly be a peculiar use as a label to call my humble plumber scientist, but then again, it would be strange to think that any point of epistemological interest hinge on withholding that status from him. Are Inuit hunters tracking Norwell scientists? Not really, but their sleuthing techniques are so impressive that real scientists have enlisted their help to study their elusive animals. As Thomas Huxley observed, every time a savage tracks his game, he employs a meanness of a service and accuracy of inductive and deductive reasoning, which apply to other manners who assume reputation as a man of science. And we see examples of the sound people of South Africa who use Bayesianism and mathematical logic as a probability to use their hunting techniques to track animals using footprints, etc. Most strongly different between hunter character and scientists is technical apparatus. Systematic observation, peer review, statistical analysis are not some important from an epistemic point of view. In a similar fashion, what paleontologists are doing when they are finding out the cause of extinction of dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous bears a striking resemblance to what detectives is doing when looking for a smoking gun. The problem of extinction of the animal is far too daunting for single human research to crack, given our cognitive and perceptual talents, but does not make it of a different order altogether. It definitely does not show that tracking animals or solving murder mysteries is somehow beyond the limits of science. Quite apart from the continuity of science with everyday knowledge acquisition, it should be obvious that science will not even get off the ground without everyday knowledge. As Pullman writes, the very practice of science needs to presuppose some forms of non-scientific knowledge. As far as we can tell, all scientific work in the universe is performed by human beings and are constrained by their convent and perceived talents. Even the remote and most abrusive objects of scientific investigation are accessible only through our innate perceptual affordance. Seeing specks under this microscope, reading of a tile, digging up shards or fossils, knowledge about those prima primary same data is not by itself scientific. Any fool can read a dial, peer through a telescope, or see a scrapitated fossil. But again, if that constitutes a limit to science, our question about scientific living will become completely trivial. Science is not a divine gift to set up us from the heavens. It was gradually built up of our ordinary human con connection, but we knew that all along. Plumbers, piano makers, and paleontology all possess specialized factual knowledge, but the difference between their methods are not indicative of any epistemological limit to science. Science, in the narrow sense, is just a convenient word to single out a collective human endeavor for developing a more systematic understanding of reality, and for a referee of those parts of the universe do not lend themselves to immediate observation or folk understanding. Lots of human knowledge falls outside of science in this sense, but not in the way they establish any epistemic limit to science. If there are any limits between science, craftsmanship, and everyday knowledge, there are pragmatic nature reflecting our cognitive makeup, our human interests, and our epistemic division of labor. Ethical Fences in the border between science and everyday knowledge are perverse and pragmatic. In the same is true in the border between neighbory discipline and academia for further treatment. A, universe, a university campus map need not track any epistemic fault line. I have previously argued that we should distinguish between two dogmation problems in the philosophy of science, the normative demarcation between good science and pseudoscience, and the territorial demarcation between science and other academic endeavors, such as philosophy. But philosophy is just science with less data history or mathematics. Normative demarcation is a precious matter as much hinge of where a theory falls. Pseudoscience is harmful to society. A philosopher's side had better be able to separate from a real thing. Unlike a normative science, pseudoscience divides, however territorial demarcate lines carry little epistemic import. Regardless of whether you include history or philosophy within the domain of science or not, there are no dire consequences for these disciplines. One indication that territorial demarcation is largely a systematic issue is that corresponding word for science does not have the same scope in different languages. The German word Wirtschaft, for it is considerably broader than the English science, compromising humanity as well as the natural and social science. Take an example of history. Historians use methods that are appropriate in their subject domain, such as a thick description and multi-layer casual narratives. Does that mean there is a unique historical method different from the method used in the natural sciences? Perhaps, but not in the sense that any 
interest limits of science has thereby been demonstrated. Many people think there is a sharp distinction between history and the natural science because historians tell stories and do not produce predictive knowledge, often have a simplistic and outdated conception of the natural science in the first place. Moreover, history and the natural science are mutually dependent on each other, uh, findings and methods. For instance, historians rely on the body of physical knowledge about radioactive decay raised to the historical documents and artifacts. In turn, in turn historians can provide data to linguistics, cognitive sciences, who study the evolution of human language. Or take my own discipline, philosophy. Some of my colleagues still regard philosophy as independent but conceptual prior to science. Philosophers supposedly have their own pri uh, priority problems and methods. If they need to be bothered with scientific knowledge at all, it merely to critically question its assumption and prepositions. In the eyes of this philosopher, it is a serious category mistake to conflate a purely philosophical problem with a merely empirical one. These ideas, while still fashionable in some philosophical quarters, are on the way out. I may indulge in some wishful thinking here. Much of the philosophy is now tightly in share in the web of knowledge. Philosophy of mind shares into covenant science, neurology, and linguistic. Epistemology is in the way with the cognitive psychology and evolutionary biology. The special science often deal with conceptual issues that can be characterized broadly philosophical in nature, and to which philosophers have indeed made useful co contributions. In biology, for instance, the study of systematic shades into philosophical debates about natural kinds, essentialism, and family resemblance. Philosophers of mind have made important contributions to the st scientific study of the mind. For instance, Daniel Dennett, with his multi traff model of consciousness and his work on the, in the intentional state mentioned above, or Fodor, with his similar work on the mind's multi Modularity. Contemporary psycholinguistics is embedded to philosophy of language, for instance, the analysis of speech acts and conversational implications. Human knowledge is a thick night web, there is no way to dis uh, distangle science, no matter how you construct it, from such neighboring disciplines as history, philosophy, or even metaphysics. It is not entangled in the web of knowledge, change or that is not knowledgeable at all. From this unabashedly naturalistic and holistic vantage point, if science has any limit deserving of the name, it must be with some way knowing that it is sufficiently discontinuous with science to make for a relatively crisp border. Scientists then would be attempt to overstep that boundary to apply the method society in domain where they have no authority. In the allowing sections, I consider two candidate domains that are often claimed to be inaccessible to science and that seem to make for a sharp boundary, the supernatural realm and the moral realm. And spoiler alert, the, mo the, the very concept of the supernatural, paranormal, immaterial, etc. has been debunked. Like everybody in consensus from mathematicians, scientists, philosophers with PhD attack. In fact, they have rejected concept altogether. In regard to moral, there are entire scientific evidence of morality and the origins of ethics. So it's it's completely debunked. But for the sake of the argument, let's assume that somehow it's still there is still a limit. The supernatural realm. Does the method science permit us to obtain knowledge about supernatural paranormal entities? It will be easy to dismiss the question out of hand as to follow no supernatural realm exists, that which does not exist cannot king if the cannot possibly be off limit to science. As in the class of Condodre, the present uh, is is it the present king of France bold. Even for staunch atheists, however, it might be interesting to refer on the question if some god did it, would she or he be on the radar of science? A number of philosophers, scientists, unbelievers, as well as believers, they argue against this notion. Science, they mean they cannot deal with the supernatural claim as a matter of principle. This doctrine goes by the name of methodological naturalism. In the earlier uh, publication, my co-authors and I criticized this methodological structure, argued that science does have a barrier of supernatural claims. If there really was some sort of supernatural being at work in the universe, intervening with, from outside or influence events in some other mysterious way that would prevent scientists from smoking this being out, as long as this god or gods or ghost catch interact with the observable world, he, she, it would be amenable to scientific investigation. Considering extent religious tradition, depending on the specific creed, supernatural beings had different degrees of involvement with the natural world. Creationism, revelation, miracles, answering prayers, etc. But although many gods are somewhat shy and aloof, usually they are not completely separate from the natural realm. Many supernatural claims enjoy wide appeal today among both lay people and academic theologians, are in fact perfectly enabled to scientific investigation. Even a deist car could potentially leave, uh, leave traces, producing a universe different from that that we expect without a divine in either. 
While it may be hard to imagine at this point how supernatural me could make their comeback in Saya after being gradually completely expunged, there is nothing that prevents this in principle. So both Dalsa struck gold mine and again, a uh, perpetuationary uh, prayer were found to work, and we discovered that invisible spirit beings are looking in the woods, will we have reached the limits of science? Will scientists throw their hands up and they admit their defeat? Exactly the opposite will happen. There will be a further excitement in the scientific community and research will immediately try their best to figure out what was going on. In the case of dowsing, geologists will start to investigate the condition under which drowsing works. Must the drowser possess special skills or does magical powers inherit in the drowsing rod itself? What is the maximum radius of drowsing rods? If we cut the rod in two, do we, uh, do we now have the Two functional Jossie rods? What kind of materials are the rods sensitive to? Does this mysterious Jossie scale fit within the fold of physicalism? Or will it uproot some or of our deepest metaphysical assumptions about the world? Granted, at some point, such scenarios of supernatural discovery started to look slightly preposterous, if not even clear whether supernatural concepts are coherent in the first place. If ghosts are immaterial it can move through walls, how can they get rattles, shutters, and doors? But if some supernatural views are too vague and incoherent to even empirically evaluate, that is not a limitation of science, but a figure of those who dabble in such views. In any case, if we see the fine straw evidence for the supernatural, scientists will have to abandon their provisional commitment to methodological naturalism. Those who see methodological naturalism as a science as a strict limitation fail to appreciate its open-ended and inclusive character. In science, finding feedback into methods and not this carving stone forever, for example, double-blind method in medical research became static because we discovered the unconscious influence of expectation the power of placebo pad. If our psychological constitution were immune to such unconscious influence, our research method would follow suit. If centenarian psychologist does exhibit anything like the placebo effect, a research protocol for centenarian medicine will not and need not include double-blind features in the case of any centenarian just swallow pills or whatever suits their an anatomy and wait to see what happens. Methodological naturalism is a pragmatic guideline, not a precondition of science. In different disciplines and at different times in the history of science, scientists have learned that they do not make any headway by invoking miraculous causes of supernatural beings. Supernatural explanations for phenomena of nature, for example, in terms of ghosts or gods or goblins, have been superseded by blind and impersonal causes. Because many pe people mistake this naturalistic outgrowth of science self imposing limitation, they think the method of science prohibits from evaluating supernatural claims to venture beyond the natural realm so the argument goes you need other ways of knowing but the absence of God's goals from science is just contingent result of our investigation into the world and this more track record supernatural explanation. Similar point apply to other methodological principles of science. For instance, if you think that practice of science presupposes the lawful regularity of nature or the comprehensibility of the world or the usefulness of mathematics, you are getting things exactly backwards. Scientists have discovered regularities in the world and we learned that mathematics, some if not all, flourish remarkably useful tools for understanding reality. But mathematics is not an indispensable tool of science. Science. Darwin of the origin of species does not contain a single equation. Historians and sociology does not discover anything like the laws of human society nor do they need despite the misconception of Marx, Hengel, and others. The open and the nature of science makes it hard to construct claims about its limits. There is no circumscribed uh, uh, set of scientific methods independent from contingent results of science and features of our cognitive makeup. New scientific findings can inspire new methods, and these are subsequently incorporated into the toolbox of science. It's a form of weak history to take for granted that the way science conducted now was somehow inevitable or how science ought to be. Does this mean that science can venture anywhere? Not necessarily. For example, it may be argued that some conceivable supernatural beings would be beyond the limits of any science, humor, or otherwise. Suppose there is a god, but one who abides by strict non-interventionist policy, never offering itself up for observation, and being infinitely devious in covering up his track, in such a world, in these science would be important to find out anything by this god. But we should be perfectly happy to acknowledge that hermetically untestable claim. Such as Bertrand Russell's notion that the world was created five minutes ago, which perfectly appears of old age. In some sense, beyond the limits of science to evaluate, which of course no reason at all to take them seriously.
A portrait and allegory that can be found in the real world. Events that fall outside the past, like cone, earthly observers are accessible to science because any information covering those points in space time will have to travel faster than light to reach us, which is prohibited by the theory of special relativity. But there is no reason for the faithful to rejoice. If science cannot catch a glimpse of these occluded parts of reality, then neither can any other way of knowing. No revelation, sensitive inatis, personal intuition, or inner self certainty will succeed where science has failed. Squaring the circle is not a limit to geometry. It is there where some other magical way to use a compass and rule to pull off a trick. This, however, is exactly what is proclaimed by many defenders of methodological naturalism as a limit of science. Many theologians will gravely pronounce that the supernatural realm is beyond the limits of science, then jump quickly to the conclusion that their favorite way of knowing can lift the veil of mystery. As theologian Paul de Vries, possibly the originator of the principle of methodological naturalism, put it, if we are free to let natural science be limited to their perspective under the guidance of methodological naturalism, then other sources of truth will become more defensible. However, to insist that God talk being included in natural science is to submit unwisely to the modern myth of scientism the myth that all truth is scientific. The theological agenda behind methodological naturalism and invocation of scientism is clear. Science must be curtailed and reigned in so that somehow by default room for other ways of knowing will become vacant. The room can be then be swiftly occupied by religious revelation, spiritual experience, or the deliverance of our sensitive inactives, all of which are much more profound than the vocal methods of empirical inquiry. On the such duration, concludes the theologian John Hawkes, theology is free from moonlighting in the explanatory domain that science now occupies, so it may now aggravate to its more neutral setting, as level at depth in which science cannot reach. This use of scientists and campus as an Im immunizing strategy for the thing supernatural realm from scientific incursion often occurs in apologist literature. In recent Concerted attack of scientists published by Blomsbury. The editors write that most worrying aspects of scientism is its insistence of naturalist, materialist, and metaphysical orthodoxy. Within the worldview of scientists, they lament there is no longer room for any sort of transcendence, the answers are human relatedness, and transsituational values and moral generality. In the closing lights of this sermon against the evils of scientism, the reader is enjoyed to go for a bear witness to transcend this, so those lost souls still under scientism spell may begin to hear a still voice that whisper beyond the molecules, inviting us to do much more. Can the term scientist still be redeemed after such ramblings? The Moral Realm is there any instant that of science generally overreaching pretending to offer a foreign knowledge that is principle and accessible, no matter how broadly you construct science? If any candidate fits the job description of the concept of scientists, I think it's the notion proposed by authors such as Sam Harris and Richard Carrier that science can provide an objective basis of morality. More value these authors claims are objects of scientific investigations just like electrons, DNA, and inflation. However, I think this issue was settled almost three centuries ago by David Hume in 1739, where he noted that it is logically impossible to write out from is. Many had tried to cross this it out gap, but to no avail. More realism is a baseless as it was in Hume's day, and scientific advances since Hume's day will offer a little help for recent critical assessments. We are invariably happy in argument for more realism that some optimize is so personally smuggled in among the, the is premise. Harris, for instance, already assumed the value of the well-being of conscious creature from the start, only to then see it confirmed in scientific research. But that's like finding the Easter egg that you just hid away yourself. Well, I, true along with, uh, the, with Harris, who vote for criteria like the well-being of conscious creatures as a study for, for ethical reasoning, it makes no sense to argue that this value itself a finding to science. Science is invaluable in reasoning more disputes, but only after some more value have been plugged in. If Hume is right, out cannot be derived from is. Simple science, regardless of whether the is compromised scientific knowledge or any other sort of knowledge, in this context, and it does not matter how broad and exclusive your definition of science may be, if you bring the social science and the humanity to the table, you will not make a headway in established subjective moral facts. No method continues with the sciences, in the broadest possible sense, can offer any more hope in referee of moral facts. There is because there are any. 
which means that again the problem is not so much of a limitation of science per se. If more maths do not exist, it is hardly surprising that no math is capable of finding them. Still, even if we admit no other way of knowing will succeed their science fails, Harris and Carrier still seem to have strangely misplaced confidence in the specialized sciences. If you are more uh, more realist and you think that Hume got it all wrong, it's unclear why you will need neuroscience or other specialized science to establish moral facts. If there is such a queer entity as moral facts out there in the world, why expect to find them under a brain scanner? Harris in particular imagines the sophisticated equipment, fMRI scan and the like will somehow carry us across the barrier that would otherwise be on a bridgeable, objective validating the well-being and suffering of conscious creatures, but why would we need to put someone on their brain scan to find out, say, that he is in pain? Would it be sufficient to hear howls of agony? In any case, if you must try, neither everyday knowledge nor cutting edge science will bring us one step closer to breaching the gap. If in Mackie is right, there simply are no more facts, give you a bizarre doctrine like more realism, a patina of neuroscientific legitimacy will make the position any more coherent, but at this misplaced confidence of deliverance of neuroscience qualify as a form of scientism. Conclusion The science has limit? Sure, but if you stretch the if if you think so, it's you just stretching to find an excuse why there is limit. The cause of science has some fuzzy practical institutional semantic boundary, but they are not relevant to the notion of epistemic living. The question of whether other ways of knowing besides science for a naturalist, science is continuous with everyday knowledge and a match with other academic endeavors. Science we know is resolved for the interplay between our kind of make of the world. Our minds and our world there is like two blades of the pair of scissors. To use Herbert Simmons' 1955 memorial metaphor, the alignment of two blades is what makes science work, but in different world, or with different brain, science will look like different indeed. Does this unified web of knowledge break down somewhere? I had tried to find a domain of reality that would call for a generally different way of knowing, sufficient discontinuity with the science to deserve a name of its own. The supernatural realm won't do. As long as supernatural entity makes some contact with the natural world, the living some traits, science has a foothold to investigate them. The idea that science is by its very nature restricted to natural causes, but it does not hold up to scrutiny. Science was work in the past. The conspicuous absence of deities from science is the continent outcome, not a prior limitation of its method. Doctrine and methodological naturalism and restriction limitation of science is immunized strategy devised by theologians and apparent by belief in belief to protect supernatural doctrine from scientific scrutiny. Science will smoke out ghosts and gods if they exist, but it can garner no factual knowledge about moral realm for the simple reason that the notion of moral fact is incoherent. No intervention factory or relevance or mystical procedure will bridge the is out gap. Here, perhaps, a suitable reference to the term scientism by claiming that neuroscience can bridge the is out gap and the objectively ground morality. Harris and Carrier seem to demand the impossible from science, so we are a type of problem that in fact cannot be solved by any method of inquiry at all. Some may argue that the Brahman holistic naturalist is defend in this chapter is itself a form of scientism. As an appropriate old way of knowing to science in the broad sense, leaves no room for religion or objective morality, and conceive of science as an infinitely flexible open ended endeavor without fixed method or rules. To end this chapter, I will perhaps confirm the worst suspicion. If a factual question is answerable at all, it can be answered using methods that are at least continuous with science. If some epistemic enterprise becomes too detached from science, and thus from the west rest of the web of knowledge, which science is connected that usually does not bode well for the enterprise, i.e. theology, analytical metaphysics, phenomenology, etc. The fact that we have conceived a world for our own systematic investigation into the natural world, science, is be an enormous source of confusion. It is often invite people to take the science depends on something called the scientific method, a simple procedure or formula that will invariably yield fruit when appropriately applied. Falling down that road, if natural to think that the scientific method is just one tool in our toolkit, next to other tools, each with its own domain application, but it's a mistake to think that the word science picks out clearly defined set of methods and procedures which can be separated from other tools and methods. If we cannot define science, the problem of scientists evaporates. In the end, a family of spatial metaphors to conceive of science as operating in certain realm with un undefinable limits or border is misleading. Science is not like a ship equipped for navigating some water but not others. 
and reality is not like a geography map with strange uncharted regions that are accessible only through some other ways of sailing. If there are any limits to human knowledge that will coincide with the limits of science, broad structure, but someday the scientific enterprise will fall off the edge of knowledge or slam up against the wall of blank and comprehension, but when the day arrives, no other way of knowledge will be of any value.